Hello, class. I hope everyone's having a wonderful day. I hope things are going well for you and your families. Uh, I'm going to be talking with you for a while today about the relationship between mind and body, which is uh, the next unit in our curriculum in Philosophy 101. And I'm going to talk to you about a number of different issues, and I'll sort of highlight those for you right now so that you're aware of what we're going to be doing. We're going to look at the three perspectives for mind and body relationships that are presented by a variety of philosophers, and uh, we're going to look at the reasonableness of each of those. The first perspective is dualism, and dualism uh, contends that mind and body are separate and distinct realities. The body, of course, which includes the brain, so we're really looking at mind and brain you know, comparison, contrast, and the relationship. Uh, but as separate and distinct realities, one is metaphysical, that's the mind, because it's not a tangible thing you can study. Uh, and the other is empirical, which is tangible, and you can't study it. So, for example, you could do uh, research in a laboratory on the human brain and how it functions, but you cannot do that same research on the mind because there's nothing physical to uh, you know, look at and analyze. So you have to analyze mind a different way than, for example, the scientific method. The uh, point of dualism, though, is that both of these realities exist and they are interactive with one another in human beings. So they each can, in some respect, affect and influence each other, okay? The view is reasonable if the philosophical presuppositions upon which this view is based are true, and we'll look at those later. Materialism is our second perspective, and materialism includes concepts like physicalism, property dualism, identity theory, and behaviorism. In this view, the body and its processes create the illusion of, quote, mind reality, end quote. The only reality in this view is empirical or physical, and what we reference as metaphysical reality, that is, mind functions, are merely ways of describing effects arising from physical processes. Again, this view is reasonable if the philosophical presuppositions upon which it is based are true. Our third perspective is called multiple realizability. And in this view, we have concepts such as instantiation, uh, functionalism, and epiphenomenalism. Now, those are highfalutin words for sure. Uh, in academia, but I'll try to unpack those and explain what they mean as we go along. Anyway, in this view, the physical processes create mind reality. As such, mind and body constitute actual realities. However, mind is understood as an empirical reality which is intangible but the product of body physical functions. Now, that's a strange way of thinking about it because empirical implies five senses, observation and experience. But in this view, the terms are being switched, so there's a kind of empirical reality according to this view, which is not tangible, which is a contradiction of the definition of empirical. But nevertheless, uh, that's the view that the physical processes and properties create an actual mind reality that is not tangible. Well, this view is only reasonable if the empirical evidence can be provided to make it certain that A, empirical processes can create non-empirical realities. And that's a big maybe. B, the types of non-empirical realities in question are really other types of empirical realities rather than being metaphysical ones. And that's a big if as well. So we'll look at these as we go along. Now, we're going to look at three arguments concerning materialism and multi multiple realizability, and those arguments use some interesting concepts. Uh, one of our philosophers deals with the idea of zombies and how zombies can be used to defend uh, the mind as a reality, independent of 
the body or the brain. Uh, the second argument uses bats as an example and an analogy, metaphor, to uh, discuss how mind and body relate to one another. And the third uses computers and the idea of computer software, computer hardware as ways of talking about uh, mind and body relationships. Again, we'll unpack those in further detail as we progress. Anyway, the logical responses that we have to examine uh, first deal with a consciousness and self-consciousness. What do those things mean and how do they function? B, human beings as compared and contrasted with other kinds of beings, like our zombies and bats, for example. And C, human beings as they compare and contrast with technology, which is where we get into the whole comparison between human beings, brains, and minds with computers, uh, hardware, and software. So we'll look at all of these as we progress, and I'll try to make it as clear as possible. Now, I have some uh, concepts here I would like to clarify and define some terms for you that I think will be helpful. Uh, these concepts uh, are important as they're all discussed as significant ideas in the chapter in your, your text for this unit. Let's start with dualism. Well, mind-body dualism in its original and most radical formulation is a philosophical view that mind and body are fundamentally distinct kinds of substances or natures. And by substance, we don't mean physical stuff. We mean actual realities, okay? So that version now often called substance dualism, implies that mind and body not only differ in meaning, but, but refer to different kinds of entities. Thus, uh, a mind-body substance dualist would oppose any theory that identifies mind with the brain, conceived as a physical mechanism. So the idea that the brain simply creates the illusion of mind activity is rejected by the dualists, and especially the substance dualism uh, proponents. Beginning with uh, the famous dictum cogito ergo sum by French philosopher René Descartes, uh, we begin with substance dualism and Descartes as the primary proponent of this view. Of course, the cogito ergo sum in Latin means I think, therefore I am, and we've talked about that before in class as a logical construct. Descartes developed a theory of mind as an immaterial, non-extended substance that engages in various activities or undergoes various states such as rational thought, imagining, feeling, sensations, and the uh, exercise of the will or volition. Matter, or extent, uh, as an extended substance, conforms to the laws of physics in mechanistic fashion with important exception of the human body, uh, which Descartes believed is casually, or I'm sorry, is causally affected by the human mind and which causally produces certain mental events. For example, willing the arm to be raised causes the arm to be raised, whereas being hit by a hammer on the finger causes the mind to feel pain. This part of Descartes' dualistic theory, known as interactionism, raises one of the chief problems faced by Descartes and his followers, the question of how this causal interaction occurs and is possible. Okay, and that's something we'll look at more in detail as we progress. The second concept I'd like to define for you is epiphenomenalism. Epiphenomenalism is a position uh, based on the mind-body problem which holds that physical and biochemical events within the human body sense organs, neural impulses, muscle contractions, for example, are causal with respect to mental events, thought, consciousness, and cognition. According to this view, subjective mental events are completely dependent for their existence on corresponding physical and biochemical events within the human body, yet themselves have no causal eff efficacy on physical events. So the physical processes create the mental realities, but the mental realities do not, in return, uh, 
provide causation for physical functions. So, the appearance that subjective mental states, such as intentions, influence physical events is merely an illusion in this view. For instance, fear seems to make the heart beat faster, but according to epiphenomenalism, the biochemical secretions of the brain and nervous system, such as adrenaline, not the experience of fear, is what raises the heartbeat. Because mental events are a kind of overflow that cannot cause anything physical, yet have non-physical properties, epiphenomenalism is viewed as a form of property dualism. The third concept I would like to define for you is functionalism. Functionalism is a theory about the nature of mental states. According to functionalism, mental states are identified by what they do rather than what they consist of. This can be understood by thinking about artifacts like mousetraps and keys. In particular, the original motivation for functionalism comes from the helpful comparison of minds and computers, but that is only an analogy. The main arguments for functionalism depend on showing that it is superior to its primary competitors, identity theory and behaviorism. Contrasted with behaviorism, functionalism retains the traditional idea that mental states are internal states of thinking creatures. Contrasted with identity theory, functionalism introduces the idea that mental states are multiply realized. So the core idea is this. Consider, for example, mousetraps. Mousetraps are devices for catching or killing mice. Mousetraps can be made of most any material and perhaps indefinitely or infinitely many designs could be employed. The most familiar sort involves a wood platform, a metal strike bar that is driven by a coiled metal spring that can be released by a trigger. But there are mousetraps designed with adhesives, boxes, poisons, and so on as well. All that matters to something being a mousetrap at the end of the day is that it is capable of catching or killing a mouse. Contrast mousetraps now with diamonds. Diamonds are valued for their hardness, their optical properties, and their rarity in nature. But not every hard, transparent, white, rare crystal is a diamond. The most famous alternative being cubic zirconia. Diamonds are carbon crystals with specific molecular lattice structures. Being a diamond is a matter of being a certain kind of physical stuff. That cubit zirconia is not quite as clear or hard as diamonds explains something about why it is not equally valued. But even if it were equally hard and equally clear, the CZ crystal would not thereby become a diamond. These examples can be used to explain the core idea of functionalism. Functionalism is the theory that mental states are more like mousetraps than they are like diamonds. That is, what makes something a mental state is more a matter of what it does and how it functions rather than what it is made of. Now the uh, next theory I'd like to describe for you a little bit is identity theory. In your textbook, J.J.C. Smart, a philosopher in mind-brain identity theory, uh, describes this for us. Identity theory says that mental states are particular kinds of biological states, namely states of brains, and so presumably have to be made of certain kinds of stuff, namely brain stuff. Mental states, according to identity theory and SMART, are more like diamonds than they are like mousetraps. Our next concept is behaviorism. And, of course, the great proponent in uh, modern philosophy of behaviorism was the uh, philosophy, ph uh, philosopher, uh, psychologist B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner's behaviorism accepts the reality of internal mental states rather than simply attributing psychological states to the whole organism. According to behaviorism, which mental states a creature has depends on how it behaves or is disposed to behave in response to stimuli. Okay, so brain and mind activities are, are the result of external stimuli of some sort that triggers those functions. Our next concept is multiple realizability. In the philosophy of mind, the multiple realizability thesis contends that a single mental kind 
so, uh, as a property, a state, or an event, for example, can be realized by many distinct physical kinds. So you can have one mental uh, kind that manifests itself, but it may be the result of a variety of distinct physical processes. A common example is pain. Many philosophers have asserted that a wide variety of physical properties, states, or events sharing no features in common at that level of description can all realize the same pain. This thesis serves as a premise in the most influential argument against early theories that identified mental state, states with brain states, psychoneural or brain-mind identity theories. It also served as an early argument for functionalism. Non-reductive physicalists later adopted this premise and these arguments, usually without alteration, to challenge all varieties of psychophysical reductionism. This argument was even used to challenge the functionalism it initially was offered to support. So, those are the key terms we're going to look at. Now, I know there's a level of abstraction in how I describe those that might uh, trigger some questions on your part. So, let me try to clarify by going more into detail and in depth into the, the uh, main areas of dualism that... Uh, we have in the textbook. So, the overview for this portion of the lecture on the mind-body problem involves a number of points. Point A, the basic problem or issue of mind and body, deals with what is the nature of the mind and of the body and how do they function in relation to one another. B, substance dualism, which looks at mental and physical realities as both valid, separate, and distinct, but interactive with one another. And of course, uh, the main proponent of this was Rene Descartes, and this is referred to as Cartesian dualism as an acknowledgement of, of Descartes' influence. C, materialism, physicalism. Uh, Subpoint one, logical behaviorism, Mental states are dispositions of leading to behaviors determined by physical phenomena. This view says physical processes cause uh, dispositions that we refer to as mental activity and mental states. And subpoint two, identity theory. The idea that mental states are identical to brain states, so we simply describe mental states as we do but we must realize that they are the result of physical brain states and processes. Point D, multiple realizability, a mind without a brain, alien life forms, and artificial intelligence are all areas under multiple realizability that are used to try to explain how mental and brain states can function and how mind uh, or mental states can be separate and distinct from physical processes. Point E, property dualism, uh, deals with the idea that mental properties are non-physical features arising from but not reducible to physical properties. So uh, mental properties occur as a result of physical processes, but they are not reduced to physical stuff. They still are intangibilities that uh, are distinct and unique from uh, you know, physical properties. And then point F, epiphenomenalism, which states that mental properties exist alongside physical processes but cause nothing. So the mental processes arise from physical processes and are real, but they don't cause any effects in the physical processes. So let's look first at substance dualism and Descartes. Descartes asserted, first of all, that mind and body are separate, distinct, and real. Second, he said that bodies have extensions, that is, dimensional reality. For example, height, width, depth, breadth, etc. So, we can see this in all physical things, that they have these dimensional properties. And he said this is the, the nature of bodies. He then says that point three that minds are non-physical, consisting of consciousness and comprising 
what he claims are our true selves. And our true selves exist as intangible realities like spirit, soul, and that, that those realities are our truest identity and they inform the body concerning its functions and how to express that identity through physical stuff. So, we now have to look at what Anselm raised as the contrast between imaginary and conceivable. And Descartes' view opts for conceivability, uh, that is, whatever is conceivable is real and or logically possible. Uh, this is in contrast to imaginability, which is whatever is imaginable is not logically real. Whether it is potentially possible lies beyond human capability. But only the conceivable can be accepted on a human level as actual or potentially actual. Okay? So let's clarify a few terms. Conceive, apprehend, and imagine as three concepts. All right? Conceive is potential for actuality or the actual. To apprehend is to actually experience that which is conceivable in some tangible way and imagine is simply to think about if you will things that are not conceivable but are possible to to contemplate now point two under conceivability deals with multiple personality disorder and the body mind divisibility argument sub point a argues that dividing the body is not equivalent to dividing the mind. The component parts of the body may be divided. However, this does not create multiple bodies. Rather, it simply fragments the one existing body. To correctly apply this analogy, one would conclude that, quote, dividing the mind, end quote, assuming such an effect is even possible, would simply fragment the mind into various parts. This is an important point because this means in schizophrenia and multiple personality disorder, it's not multiple identities that are being expressed. It is a fragmentation of the mind which expresses itself in a variety of ways that lead to the illusion that you have multiple minds operating when in fact it's one mind fragmented into various parts that express themselves in a variety of ways. Subpoint B, the argument assumes that the mind is like the body in terms of consisting of multiple interrelated parts. Just as you could take a body and dissect it and see all the different organs and parts and their functions, this argument says you can do the same thing with the mind. However, no evidence exists which establishes that this is possible or even the case. Perhaps the mind is not like the body in this sense of being comprised of various parts that could be uh, dissected and separated out to examine. In fact, this seems to make more sense, seeing that the body is physical and that the mind is not. So the view that the body is a, a, an assemblage of various parts that can be examined individually and collectively is fine. But assuming that the mind is like the body in that regard, uh, is not logically supported because there is no evidence to suggest that that's the case. Maybe the mind is holistic and complete and just has ways of expressing itself in different manners. Subpoint C. Perhaps multiple personality disorder is simply one mind manifesting in a variety of effects and phenomena for some reason which may or may not be fully explainable at this time. However, it does seem to make more sense that the mind is one mind, not many different minds operating, uh, but that that one mind can express itself in a variety of ways. The assumption that all physical effects are the result of physical causation is not proven. One can easily argue just as effectively that physical effects, at least some of them, result from non-physical ca causation. In fact, this precisely fits the theological position regarding the creation of the universe as put forth by the Judeo-Christian scriptures of the Bible. It also conforms to Einstein's mathematics and the uh, singularity theory we call the Big Bang.
The problem of a closed empirical system, causal closure of physical empirical reality. Well, first, it makes, it makes for neat arguments, but the premise is unfounded. There is no logical reason to assume a closed system which is only empirical, so everything manifested in that system has to be empirical. Second, presuppositional claims do not intrinsically constitute proof. They must be substantiated through logic, reason, and evidence. Otherwise, they are merely assertions and statements of opinion. Third, applying physical laws and properties to metaphysical realities makes no sense. By its very nature, metaphysical reality transcends empirical reality. Therefore, using matter and energy as they exist and operate in the empirical realm to explain metaphysical, quote, matter, whatever that could possibly mean, and spiritual energy makes no sense. Any conclusions are highly suspect at best, if not altogether ridiculous. So, we have to be honest about the meanings of words. Empirical means physical stuff that can be observed and experienced through tangible means such as the five senses. Metaphysical reality means non-empirical stuff that must be understood through transcendent means of logic, reason, and evidence, but at the same time can be supported through physical experience, which may be expressions of non-physical realities as they operate upon the body. Now, I would like to take a few minutes to talk to you about three of the philosophers in this chapter of the book. I mentioned them before. One is J.J.C. Smart and his idea that there is no difference between uh, mind activity and brain activity, that they're really essentially the same thing. We just talk about them in different ways. Second, David J. Chalmers uh, and his theory defending the separation of mind from brain as realities using the analogy of zombies. And then third, Thomas Nagel, uh, who argues that uh, subjective awareness is really the primary means through which we analyze mind and body or mind and brain relationships. And he does this by using the analogy of what it, what it means to be a bat and uh, applies that to consciousness and the reality of consciousness. So let's look at each of these in turn for a few minutes. Uh, J. J. C. Smart, in his Sensations and Brain Processes, argues that mind states and brain states are identical. Sensations are nothing more than brain processes. Thoughts are these types of sensations. So thoughts have no independent reality of their own. They're simply the effects of brain processes, brain functions. So sensation belongs to the empirical realm in his view, the realm of the senses, whereas thought does not. And this is a problem for J.J.C. Smart because he must try to make thought empirical for his theory to hold up. If thought is intangible and non-empirical, it raises questions about how you would ever determine empirically that thought is not a non-empirical reality. And certainly we all have thoughts that seem to be real to us and yet intangible. He uses the analogy of lightning and electrical current to try to make his case. And he says that lightning and electrical current are both clearly physical things, which is true. But his analogy begins to break down when he says lightning and electrical current are like the uh, mind and the body and their processes and functions. For his analogy to be valid, he would have to establish that the mind and the brain are both clearly empirical. But this is not necessarily the case. In fact, there is no empirical way to show that the mind is empirical. It takes a leap of faith to simply start with the assertion that empirical things are reality and they cause everything else which seems to be real, but in fact is simply the result 
of empirical processes. So his analogy of lightning and electrical current begins to break down because he's comparing two physical empirical things with two things that are not necessarily both physical. One, the mind being intangible and non-physical. So at that level, the comparison between lightning and the mind breaks down. There's no way to make that comparison. And this is a problem for J.J.C. Smart. He also uses the idea of nations and citizens as an analogy, saying that uh, nations are like uh, the mind as a concept, but the actual reality are the citizens who make up the nation, and that they are uh, the realities that cause uh, what appears to be the reality of nation, but in fact it's really just the individuals that comprise the nation that are real. Okay, uh, The problem with this view, though, is a misunderstanding of nations as a, an abstract ideal or concept. For example, there are about 350 million people who live in the United States. Those are the citizens. Of course, not all are citizens, but let's just say for the sake of argument, they, all of them are citizens, to follow uh, Smart's analogy. If that's the case then Smart would say, there is no America, only the citizens that live here. And that's the only reality. And these citizens, as, as processes, manifest themselves in ways that make us think of America as a nation. Okay? That all sounds fine and well and good, except for the fact that there are concepts that are abstract, such as the idea of the American dream. The idea of American nationalism, okay? Uh, the idea of the American spirit. All of those things cannot be analyzed empirically through the scientific method, yet most people would agree that those things have a reality, that the American dream is something real that can be realized, it's conceivable, it can be realized by individuals. So uh, his analogy, again, he wants to impose on nations an empirical uh, reality and only an empirical reality when, in fact, nations could be abstract ideas that have a reality of their own. Second, when we look at David J. Chalmers and his work, The Conscious Mind, where he argues uh, the analogy comparing humans and zombies, here's what we find. He says that creatures that are physically identical to humans but without minds are conceivable, okay? Now, I think he equivocates here and commits the logical fallacy of term switching by confusing conceivable with imagined, okay? Because I know of no actual zombies or potential actual zombies that can be demonstrated empirically to exist, now, I'm not talking about those individuals who are paralyzed due to uh, uh, being ingesting poison from plants or frogs, like in the Caribbean and South America. They get labeled as zombie-like. But they're not true zombies in the sense that Chalmers is talking about. Them. True zombies are those that you find in pop culture, in books, in movies, uh, you know, like, like Night of the Living Dead, that film. Uh, these are imagined or made-up fantasy creatures for the sake of uh, telling a story or narrative or producing an effect. But no one really argues that these fictional characters or fictional inventions are realities in the same sense as humans. So right there, his analogy begins to, to break down to fragment. So, the ability to conceive of the possibility of such creatures does not establish likelihood that such creatures actually exist. And this is why I say conceivability is the wrong term. The fact that you can imagine such creatures as zombies doesn't mean they can actually exist or have the actual potentiality for existence. However, even if creatures such as Chalmers, zombies exist, 
This still doesn't establish his case that consciousness in humans is non-physical or metaphysical. Now, I would agree with Chalmers that there's a strong case in substance dualism for saying body, brain, physical realities exist. And also that mind, consciousness realities exist. One empirical, one non-empirical or metaphysical. I would agree with that view. I just don't think his analogy using zombies makes a very strong or very good case. He, of course, seems to equivocate or confuse, conceive, and imagine. That which is imagined, by definition, is, isn't real, whereas that which is conceived has the possibility of being real or is actually real. Go back again to what I've said before in class about the uh, idea of conceiving a child and then the idea of actually uh, having that child conceived and then delivered nine months later as a living human being. So uh, Chalmers' analogy, I think, fails because he's comparing apples and oranges in a way. All right? By trying to say that zombies who have physical bodies and uh, brains do not have independent minds. And yet human, humans would seem to have those. So he says since uh, humans and zombies are alike in some ways, this is his, his argument from analogy uh, fallacy, they must be alike in, in all ways. And of course that's, that is not logically uh, demonstrable. Our third philosopher is Thomas Nagel, and in his work, What It Is Like to Be a Bat, he contends that scientifically analyzing all of the physical properties of a bat will not reveal what it is really like to be a bat. And he argues that only a bat can understand what it's like to be a bat. Now that sounds really good. Uh, it, it's akin to someone saying, if you have not uh, ingested hallucinogenic drugs, you can't possibly know what it's like to uh, have the effects, physical effects of, not, of hallucinogenic drugs on the body. Or to say, a woman to say that since you can't, can't a man cannot become pregnant and uh, carry a child for nine months and then deliver it, a man can't possibly know what it's like to be pregnant. Well, this is only partially true. In the uh, context of uh, pregnancy, while it's true that a man can't experience pregnancy like a woman, this doesn't mean that he can't intellectually or emotionally understand important things about what a woman experiences through pregnancy. He can. By observation and study and by interaction with a woman, he can learn a lot about what that experience is like. While it is true he can't ultimately experience it all himself, he can know a lot about what it's like. And to say that we can't do that breaks down any kind of scientific observations we would make because whatever we are observing, we can't possibly really understand because we're not that thing. So, for example, studying uh, you know, the horned owl in nature, is futile and pointless because you can't possibly understand what it's like to be an owl. Therefore, you can't understand anything about what it's like to be an owl. This seems to be a great fallacy in, in uh, his reasoning processes. Uh, the argument that empirical analysis is not applicable to subjective awareness does not prove that subjective awareness exists, which is his contention. Uh, his argument that empirical analysis is not applicable to subjective awareness doesn't prove that subjective awareness or consciousness is metaphysical, which is what he attempts to prove. Uh, in nature, any more than the result of brain processes or brain activities. Now, going back to bats, I know a little about bats because I worked in a cave uh, and did educational tours for a number of years back in my younger days, and I was trained at the Ozark Underground Laboratory through uh, MSU by one of the premier hydrologists and cave experts uh, in the country. His name was Dr. Tom Ailey, and he taught at MSU, and I was trained under him 
uh, every year at the Ozark Underground Laboratory down at Protem, Missouri, which is a research cave that studies uh, surface and subsurface relationships in terms of air water movement, but also studies cave life, like the blind cave fish, uh, the blind cave crawfish, uh, bats of various kinds, the Missouri gray bat, the eastern pipistrel bat, these different creatures and insects of different kinds, the cave cricket and different things, are studied at that lab. Well, part of my experience there was to examine what those studies had to say about bats. And if Dr. Ailey were here with you today, he would tell you not only is it possible that you can study bats and learn a lot about what it's like to be a bat, it is uh, a certainty that this is true. In fact, he would argue that he probably knows more about being a bat than a bat does because we have no evidence whatsoever that bats are self-conscious and aware on the level that they can think about their identities as bats. Rather, it seems that bats are creatures that function in an environment, they're immersed in an environment where they do bat things because this is how that environment interacts with them in terms of their functioning. But there's no evidence that they consciously think about being a bat. There are no poems written by bats that are titled, I am a bat and here's why. Okay? That becomes ridiculous when you start to push it to its, its ultimate conclusions. On the other hand, Dr. Ailey has studied bats for many years and written uh, scholarly journal articles about cave life and bats in which he explains what bats are like and what it's like for them to be bats. And I would argue this makes perfect sense. So Nagel's argument falls flat, in my opinion, at its inception by arguing that you can't understand or know anything about something that you are not yourself. Again, if that's the view that's adopted, to be consistent and push it to its conclusion means we can't know anything other than ourselves. I can't know anything about you as a person that really has meaning. I can't know anything about uh, a tree. I can't know, uh, you know anything about a lawnmower because I'm not those things. But again, that starts to appear ridiculous when we understand that the human mind seems to be capable of analyzing things other than itself and drawing conclusions about what those things are and what they mean. Go back to my law of identity, the first law of uh, logic. That law says things are what they are because they have the essential qualities and characteristics that are unique to them that make them that thing and nothing else. And nothing else can be them because it does, they, the other things don't have those essential qualities and characteristics. But it's possible for me, for example, to analyze the qualities and characteristics that make a dog a dog and understand dogness, if you will, without having to be a dog myself. And this is important because it's the only way we can establish any kind of meaning and order in our lives and in the world regarding all the things that are not us and how we are to understand them and interact with them and how they then interact with other things as well. So, uh, having said all of this, I'll conclude this lecture with an admission on my part, because you deserve to know, of which view I think is the most uh, defensible and most likely to be true. Well, in my opinion, Cartesian uh, substance dualism makes the most sense. Now, that doesn't mean that I fully understand Cartesian dualism and the relationship between the non-physical, metaphysical mind and the physical empirical body or brain. I don't make that claim. But I do make the claim that it makes sense to say these are distinct and separate realities that are interactive and affect one another in a variety of ways, okay? And I think this is true because it best explains 
how we seem to experience our world and how we seem to experience ourselves and our own identity, that it offers the best explanation. To use the uh, uh, example of Occam's razor, Occam's razor says, look at all of the data and the evidence and the least radical answer or solution is the best one. And this seems to be the least radical explanation or solution to the question of what is mind, what is body, and how do they function. Okay, we'll stop there. I kept this around 45 minutes, so it's uh, manageable for you, and that'll buy you a little extra time there. Again, I want to thank you for uh, joining me in this and uh, giving your attention to this lecture. Uh, I will be... Uh, of course, absent from class on October 10th because of the surgery I'm having on October 9th where they have me restricted for the next five or six days following that. But I will be back the next week. I would remind you, and this is very important, I would remind you that you have your midterm essay analysis paper due to me on the 10th. It turns out that not my daughter, but my wife will be there with you in class to pick up those papers. It's very important you show up for those classes and give her those papers. Don't be emailing me those papers because strange things happen with formatting and things arriving as they should. Bring your hard copy paper and give it to my wife. That's very important. Uh, she will be there actually from, 10, uh, from 9.45 to 10.15 on the 10th of October. That window, that 30 minute window is the ending of the philosophy class and the beginning of my religion class. I'm asking students from both classes to show up during that window and give her their papers. And you won't have to stay beyond that. You turn in your paper and you're free to go. Uh, again, I want to thank you for, for listening to this lecture. And uh, I hope that uh, you have a, a wonderful day. I hope that your uh, Time spent away from me is productive and beneficial to you, and I look forward to seeing you when I come back. Thank you again.